Hello and welcome back to Press Pass on GNAT TV. I'm Andrew McKeever, the news director at GNAT TV's News Project, and it's a pleasure to have you with us today on Tuesday, August 17th. It's also a great pleasure to be joined uh, by two distinguished journalists here today in our virtual studio. Really pleased to welcome back Howard Weiss Tisman, who uh, covers Southern Vermont for Vermont Public Radio, and Darren Marcy, the editor of the Manchester Journal. Gentlemen, good to have you back again. It's been, been too long. Good to be back. Anyway, uh, of course, a lot, a lot continuing uh, to go on. And Howard, let me let me start with you, if I may. Uh, the governor just finished his uh, weekly press briefing uh, a little while ago before we were coming on the air here. And I just wondered, uh, since topic A is once again COVID and now the, the Delta variant uh, and uh, the impact that's having on plans to reopen schools and uh, businesses and uh, are we going to see a return to wearing masks again? Uh, was there anything that, uh, that was said at the governor's press briefing this morning uh, that we should know about? Yeah, well, um, it was, as you said, more of the same. Um, I was kind of struck by the tone the administration seems to be taking as far as walking a line between um, continuing to give us good news about Vermont, about the number of Vermonters who are vaccinated, about our low hospitalization rates, but at the same time, Dr. Levine and the rest of the administration warning us that the Delta variant is being, um, is showing up. The numbers are going up a little bit in Vermont. So they're kind of, you know, they're kind of walking two lines at the same time saying that Vermont is in good shape. It's certainly in, in better shape than a lot of other parts of the country. But at the same time, the Delta variant is here. Uh, one of the big takeaways I got from today's press conference, um, Mike Pichak, who gives the, the daily overall reports, he said he expects the Delta numbers to plateau here and in New England pretty shortly. Um, the numbers are still going up. We're seeing more cases now than we have in many months. Hospitalizations are still low, but they're rising. And uh, Pichak said he expects that to plateau shortly uh, and in a couple of weeks or a month or so. Another thing that certainly seems to have plateaued is the vaccination rate. Uh, it's kind of inching up uh, slowly, continuing to inch up slowly, but we seem to be stuck around that uh, 84 or 85 percent mark for folks who have had at least one shot. And I think it's also in the high 70s for people who have had uh, both shots. Uh, and of course, uh, that's, uh, that's going to become a bit of an issue, I guess, uh, sh very shortly. Um, when schools reopen. I believe the latest guidance from the Agency of Education is calling for uh, uh, schools to start off the school year uh, for 10 days with uh, mandatory mask wearing for students and uh, staff and faculty uh, to give them a chance to make sure they've reached an 80% 80% vaccination rate uh, or until they do. Um, but uh, certainly I, I imagine that a lot of educators two months or so ago were thinking, we've turned the corner on this one and <laughs> we don't have to worry about, about that anymore or we right. won't have to worry about it like they, we, we did. Yeah, that was a big topic today. Um, and again, there's the, the administration tried to clarify things because there seems to be some confusion, confusion about that because they did put out that once schools are at 80%, they, they are not gonna have to wear masks. And so, so there's been a little confusion. The governor in his opening remarks made it clear that they want schools to start with masks. Now, it's interesting that we're not under a state of emergency, so the state can't mandate that. What they're doing is they're strongly suggesting it. Um, there's still some questions about remote learning it seems that the state is not going to offer that same level of remote learning that they did last year, um, which I think is going to figure into a lot of decision making that parents are making when the remote learning was a viable option. It was a lot easier to keep your kids at home. Um, of course, anyone's allowed to homeschool, so, so people can choose to homeschool, but that level of support is not going to be there. Um, there's, there are no distancing requirements right now, so the kids are going to have to be masked, but they're going to be close together. 
And one other point to remember in that while the state is saying that once schools are at 80%, they won't have to mask, of course, any elementary school is not going to get there because kids under 12 can't be vaccinated. So I think there's still, there's a lot of questions. Um, as you said, I think teachers, administrators were looking forward to some sense of normalcy. Um, it's not going to be normal starting the school year, that's for sure. There, there I think little... that's, there, I'm sorry, I, I think it's a really important point that the schools thought, you know, heading into the summer and through the summer, they thought things were going to be back to normal, and, and they're not. Um, mm -hmm. the, I'm, I'm focused here on the North Shire and the BRSU, the Bennington Rutland Supervisory Union. You know, they put out um, some guidance not that long ago that's, as far as I know, it's mostly out of date now. At least some of it is. We've got a story coming out this week that's going to be wrapping this stuff up and, and updating it and with the most recent numbers. But Arlington is putting out their information. A lot of people are still waiting to see. They're waiting to see what the state recommends. And, and uh, as, as Howard was saying, there's not really a mandate option, but they're certainly strongly recommending. And um, yeah, heading back into the school year, they're going to be they're going to be wearing masks. But there's you know the questions about the distancing and some of the the changes that schools made last year with outdoor classrooms and things like that. I think most schools did away with those plans heading back in, and uh, and they might be reconsidering some of that now with the Delta in the state. Uh, one thing that Howard had brought up that I think was really important: um, the 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 surge that that we're seeing. We're certainly lucky here in Vermont because of that 85 percent vaccination rate. Uh, down south in some of those states that have 40 and 50 percent vaccination rates, they've got a real problem on their hands. And Vermont's in a really good situation right now. That's, I think, how we could be talking about potentially hitting a peak as soon as we are. There are some places that are really just ramping up, and, and the virus is going to be a story for, for a while. So we're lucky right. here. Yeah, and the one thing about schools is without that state mandate, it's really up to each district to kind of make up their own rules, which is kind of adding to the confusion right now is that school boards have to decide from district to district how they're going to handle things um so i've often thought it would have been a lot easier for everybody if they had one uniform standard across the entire state i mean i've often been puzzled certainly was last year when when they kind of lifted it up to a lot of the individual school districts or uh, supervisory unions to make their own decisions about that but uh well, it sure would have seemed like it would have been easier to have yeah. one uniform standard across the board. Yeah. And just one more quick COVID thing. Um, uh, talking locally, tonight the Brattleboro Select Board will be considering bringing back their masking mandate. They, early in the pandemic, they required it. All stores, um, town offices, et cetera, had to have it. They took it off um, earlier in the summer, and they're going to talk about that tonight, about possibly reinstituting the mask mandate in Brattleboro. Hmm. Right. I've been kind of interested that that hasn't come up more in, in, the, in recent weeks. Um, a lot of organizations have, uh, you know, especially hospitals and places like that have, have brought back mandates. And I'm surprised there hasn't been more towns or, or other organizations that haven't uh, brought up the topic at least. I think people just, when, when they dropped the mandates back in the spring or exactly when it was, but, um, I think people were so relieved to not have to wear masks, be forced to wear masks all the time. It's hard to go back again. Um, so hopefully we can avoid it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's we'll see how that, that is going forward. It, it will be interesting to see if uh, this latest uh, uptick or spike or whatever the right term is uh, behaves as uh, Mike Pichak is hoping uh, since we do also have fall foliage season right around the corner, which is uh uh, a super important time of year for many businesses, particularly those in the very hard hit hospitality industry. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure they were all hoping uh, for a strong uh, foliage season, kind of built in part around the reputation Vermont, I think, is acquired as being a safe state to come uh, to and travel to. And uh, I, I think we've, we've sort of gained a lot of uh, good notoriety out of the whole, out of this whole experience that there's some silver lining to be grappled for in this but uh um in addition to school impact uh, there's also the business impact as well and if uh, those restaurants and, and other gift shops can't either can't find the staff to be open or are going to be having to enforce mask mandates again that's going to put a damper on things i would think yeah, absolutely there's a lot of lodging establishments and restaurants in the manchester area alone 
that are that are watching this Delta variant very closely and wondering what it's going to do to them. Um, there's not a restaurant anywhere in th that I've heard of that hasn't had some sort of an impact. Some are are limiting seating because they don't have the staff to to handle it. Other places are closing, you know, operating four days a week or something like that. Um, it's 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 tough out there. And in the, in the lodging establishments, they can't find housekeeping in in various positions to, that they need to fill. It's it's rough everywhere. Um, the the seasonal laborers apparently are are not to be found as well. Um, it's it's hard. Yeah, and it's so frustrating. You can just you know sense the constraint that all of this is putting on the economy. Um, I'm sure everybody would welcome as much business as possible. It must be so hard. Can you imagine for a motel owner, or a restaurant owner, to have to shut down or not bring in those dollars because they because they can't staff it. Um, it really must be holding. I haven't heard an economic analyst and an economic analysis of, you know, they must be able to measure what's that doing to the economy. It must be constricting growth a little bit by restaurant only open four days a week. It's just less money flowing through the economy. So uh, I think it's on September 4th when uh, the federal $300 unemployment bonuses or additional payments uh, to folks who uh, who had to leave work uh, is going to be removed and no longer happening. I mean, a lot of people have said, well, the reason you know, you're having trouble finding workers is that they can make more money being at home and collecting that $300 benefit uh, plus other unemployment insurance and go and come back to work. Do you, do you, have you got any sense from talking to uh, business owners in your respective areas as to whether or not they're anticipating that the workforce shortage is going to ease after uh, we get to September or not going to have an effect? I think at least in the North Shire, um, there's really more of a concern with the housing issues that this has brought. Um, all of our housing got bought up by folks that were fleeing dangerous places, you know, from the city. And um, a lot of housing, a lot of rental stock is now single family residences uh, or you know second homes for for folks from from the city and um there's just not rentals so the folks that they are counting on to wait tables and, and change beds have no place to live and a lot of them have moved on to other places that I, i've understood that to be one of the biggest uh, impediments right now as well as child care issues so well, it's funny you should mention that, Darren, because <laughs> Howard last week uh, put together a really interesting piece on uh, housing shortages, focusing on the ski towns over in Wyndham County, Dover, and, and Wilmington. And, and Howard, I guess uh, I'd like to invite you to walk us through that story. What did you learn when you were uh, researching that story? Right. Well, really what struck me about that story, and Darren kind of alluded to it, is that in these ski towns, there's kind of two things going on. Um, people who are building expensive houses, they can't build them quick enough. You know, I spoke to one guy, he's two years out. Um, you know, he's usually booking for next year. If you want a house next year, sure, he'll fit it in. This guy is two years out at this point. So if you want, you know, a $400,000 log cabin, no problem. But if you're a working family, a teacher, a service worker, the affordable housing is just not there. So it's really interesting that there are these two issues going on at the same time where there's a housing boom and a property boom, um, but just nothing and less and less affordable stuff. You know, one thing that's important to point out, uh, both with housing and with workforce, is that it was tight before COVID. You know, this is not new in Vermont. We've been talking about workforce shortages for years. We've been talking about housing shortages for years. And it just kind of tightened the screws on everything. Um, the workforce shortage, as far as the unemployment insurance ending, uh, my colleague at VPR, Pete Hirschfeld, did a story on this a week ago or so. And it's not um, quite as crystal clear as that. It, it, a lot of it goes back to our demographics. And the number of people in Vermont's workforce is going down because we're just getting older and we're not having babies and young folks are not moving here. So every month, every year, more people leave the workforce and there's just no one on the other end of the pipeline to do it. So I think that's it as much as anything. Um, like Darren said, I don't think 
come September, when the unemployment runs out, there's going to be a big rush for people to fill jobs um, at all. It'll be really interesting to see the ski industry, how the farm workers um, come in with, with COVID too, and how that impacts them coming up. So um, these, are, these are deeply entrenched issues that it's going to take a very long time. It's easy to be um, kind of uh, anxious about it because there's no easy fixes about it for sure. And Darren, I, I didn't think I cut you off there a little bit when you were starting to talk about the situation over here on this side of the mountain in Manchester. Uh, but it sure sounds from everyone I've been talking to uh, over here that, boy, it's inventory is just about as tight as they've seen it. Yeah, it, it really is. There's there's just not a lot out there. And, and as Howard mentioned, it's the it's the lower the, the more affordable housing that's that's really struggling. You can you can find a high end home if uh, if that's what you're looking for. But finding uh, that two hundred thousand dollar house if you're looking to buy or an affordable rental that's that's really where where the problems are. Um, I, I I've got people telling me they're driving from Glens Falls and things like that to to work in Manchester because they can't find anything within 30 minutes or so of, of, of this town to, to, to live in. Um, yeah, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I think we're, we're 10 years behind on where we should be as far as producing new houses, but there's, they're, they're not building the low end houses because the money, the profit's not there. They're making money on those half million dollar homes. They're not, they don't make a lot of money when you build a $150,000, $200,000 house. So that's that's part of it as well. Um, we've got a story coming out soon, if it's not already online. The, some new numbers have come in related to the census, and there's, there's it shows the boom that this state has experienced, particularly in the the ski towns and things. Um, some some big triple digit increases in 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 populations and things in, in places. Um, it's 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 crazy the number of folks who moved in. It'd be interesting to see how many of them stay. Uh, are they here permanently? Or are they already looking for a place where they came from to, to move back now? So it'll be interesting. Right. Maybe and there might be data, a lot of houses for, for sale soon. Who knows? Right. And that data, too, tells a tale of kind of two Vermonts where the ski towns, Ludlow, Stowe, Wilmington, Dover, saw an increase in the census. And then towns like Springfield, Newport, right. uh, Rockingham saw a real serious dip. So low-income folks are fleeing, and people who have means are coming. Um, it, and it's 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 not Vermont. That's our country, kind of in a nutshell, too. You know, the gap between the rich and the poor. There's just there's there's hardly any middle class. Um, you know, our Senator Sanders has been talking about it for a long time. Yeah, it is interesting uh, how these numbers are are uh, are shaking out. Uh, and just to drill down a, a level here, it, it was interesting. Uh, uh, when I was reading the story, uh, I saw it in the, in the Bennington Banner this morning, Darren, uh, about the census uh, that uh, uh, your colleague Tiffany Tan wrote. Uh, it was interesting how uh, a lot of the towns in the South Shire, like Poundle and Bennington, uh, saw decreases in population, but up in the North Shire, uh, Dorset, Sunderland, uh, Arlington, uh, were up by over 100 people in each town. Uh, Kind of interesting as to why that's going on. Yeah, and I, I, I don't have the exact answer, but I think Howard just nailed it. It's the, the haves and the have-nots. You know, it, it costs more money to live in Dorset than it does in Pownall. So, um, and, you know, the, the folks that can afford to move to pick up and, and buy a new place or whatever, are you know, they're, they're more mobile because they have the, the, the income to, to be able to do that. Um, when you're working a service industry job, you can't always just drop what you're doing and move someplace else because it's convenient. So, I... I it's going to be interesting how this all shakes out in, in the long run. Uh, you know, we, we know what the impacts are right now, but how that's going to affect everybody down the road just will be the real question. Is the cavalry coming over the hill in the form of the ARPA money? I mean, a certain uh, chunk of that was supposed to go to uh, putting in building new affordable or workforce housing. Is, is that going to be enough to kind of uh, stabilize things? From, from everything that I've heard, and I, I haven't followed this as closely as I should have, but everything that I've heard about this, most of that's a year or two years out. I mean, they're going to be looking to rehab some some dilapidated homes and things like that that would be a little bit quicker. But as far as building anything new, you know, it's certainly not going to help this winter. Um, and it seems like a lot of the ARPA money is the, from the town managers and folks I've been talking to and the, the board members, they're looking at doing projects that they've had you know in, in the works for a while and, and 
uh, affordable housing isn't always uh, on, on that list. I mean, I'm hearing about sewer systems and water systems and, and things like that um, versus affordable housing. But you know, there, there's some of that talk in every community because they all realize that if they don't have a place for people to live, they're not going to attract any new residents. So. Let's uh, move on uh, from, from that for at least a moment here, uh, Darren, because I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about uh, the latest turn of events in the uh, West Paulet uh, shooting range story with uh, uh, Daniel Banyai, who uh, uh, you, you and, uh, and the journal have done a terrific job following the story. Uh, and I was very pleased to hear on the This American Life podcast about uh, uh, Daniel Bonoy, that uh, your paper got a, a little pat in the back for its coverage, uh, along with a few, along with BPR um, yeah. and uh, BT Digger. So uh, I guess bring us up to speed here. What's what's the latest word then out of uh, Slate Ridge uh, and Mr. Bonoy? Well, the the wheels of justice turn slow, and that, as the, the the neighbors over there really know. Um, last night I went to a, a tax hearing. That, three residents are challenging their tax assessments. And it's to the point where they're actually holding hearings to uh, be able to present evidence. And Mr. Bonyai was one of the, one of the three. And it was, it was the circus you can imagine it would be. Um, he, you know, he showed up and the first thing he did was refuse to put a mask on, which was an issue. Um, he has a medical exemption. And, um, and then, uh, you know, he spent most of the meeting calling everybody names. Uh, you know, they're all corrupt and, and everything in, in Paulette. And, um, and he, he had some, some personal issues with several people and he got in the face of a couple of people. Uh, he and uh, select board member and neighbor Rich Hewlett went nose to nose on the sidewalk outside, uh, forced the constable to step in and calm things down. Um, it, it was the usual Daniel Bonyai type of a situation, you know, that's, uh, that things aren't calm when he's around. And I don't know that he got what he wanted because, uh, you know, they're asking him to present information and, and details about why his taxes are too high. And all he wanted to do was argue about how the mail is sent to him. Um, it just, you know, there's just not a lot of, a uh, lot, lot of, lot of conversation always with this. Uh, overall, the, the wheels are turning. He's challenged the, the, decision by the environmental court that he owes, uh, I can't remember the exact number now, is it 36000 a, a bunch of money uh, in fines and, and things, and, and um, yeah, various fines assessed for not being in compliance with the, with the zoning permits. Um, he's challenged that, as, as well as the fact that he's supposed to destroy all of the improvements he's made to his property, which he claims is $1.6 million, um, in, in several times he's made that claim. A lot of people doubt that number, and he's shown nothing to to prove that it's that's accurate. Um, but they they're saying that he's he's supposed to destroy all of that because it's not permitted. And the, the environmental court agreed. He's challenged that to the Supreme Court. And the the absolute most latest, just a little um, um, piece of this is his attorney has recently filed for an extension. I think she now has um, another month or so to to file their answer to the town of Paulitz. Um, request uh, on this. Um, eventually, it's going to go to the Supreme Court, likely, if, if he continues his, his opposition to the decision. And we'll go from there. Um, you know, there's, it's, it's anybody's guess as to whether he has a, a case or not. Uh, but he, he does have a, an attorney advocating for him, which is different. A lot of times he serves as his own attorney and, and uh, doesn't always do so well in, in the eyes of the courts. So we'll see what happens. Now, is it still being used as a shooting range? I, I mean, I guess there was some question as to whether or not, and I think I got this from the, from the podcast that you wrote a story about in last week's journal um, uh, about, uh, about whether or not the, the range was still being actively used. Uh, is, is, do we know what is happening? He, um, he was ordered to cease all activity on the range um, that, that involves anybody else. Nothing says he can't go out and shoot on his own land but he's not supposed to be um, holding any classes or, or providing any training or anything like that. And the neighbor said that the shooting, that the noise has gone way down in, uh, since that decision came out. There is still gunfire, there is still some traffic, but you know, it's, it's pretty secluded. You have, to, you have to trespass to see what's going on there. And so nobody really knows what's going on. Um, but he's, he's really, a lot of his social media has, has quieted down. Uh, you know, he used to be very, 
open and, and talking about what he was doing uh, on his Facebook page, which uh, he claims was taken down by the government because the or by the uh, Facebook because they're anti Second Amendment. Um, there's more to that story that uh, should come out soon. Um, but he doesn't do that anymore. The most he's claimed these days on his Twitter account is that he's building a fourth range, which is supposed to be a, a long distance range. He's claiming it's 1,400 yards. Um, I don't know. He's got 30 acres over there. So it's anything's possible. But he's, you know, who knows what's going on with the act, uh, the lack of Act 250 with all of this land clearing and wetlands impacts and things, if, if that's what's going on. The folks who have seen it claim that there is. Um, so. Uh, one of the things that came out last night with this tax situation is they appointed three members as a, a, a committee to go inspect the land to uh, see if, if his uh, claims are, are accurate or not. Whether or not he actually allows that inspection is a, is a whole other matter. Um, he's claiming that anytime, any place, anybody's welcome to come and, and take a look. But in the past, anytime that's happened, there's been reasons that have cropped up that suddenly the visit cannot happen. And so we'll see. That's scheduled for, if I remember correctly, September 5th, September 5th or something like that. So, you know, maybe we'll have some eyes on the property soon or, or maybe not. <laughs> A long running and tangled saga for sure. Yeah. Um, in a few minutes we have left, Howard, I just want to go back to you real quick, uh, just to touch again on, on some of the census data that uh, we mentioned uh, there a moment ago in connection with housing and labor. Um, it, it, it struck me that uh, there are two counties uh, that lost significant numbers of population uh, in, in Vermont. Uh, one of them was Rutland County and the other one was Wyndham, which surprised me, uh, down nearly 7% in population. And of course that becomes kind of significant because that impacts uh, political re reapportionment, which is going to be uh, one of the projects the legislature will be taking up, uh, I guess, fairly soon. And uh, I suppose we'll have in place by what, uh, the beginning of next year, I guess would be the idea. Um, is there any concern that Wyndham County might like either lose a seat either in the Senate or the House, or uh, have you been hearing anything from uh, from your sources on that? I have not heard too much about that. Um, we have, uh, you know, of course, the, the speaker lives down here. Um, we got some, some pretty active um, members, so I haven't heard that much about that, um, but, but like I said, I think we have some pretty powerful lawmakers around here, so they'll keep their eyes on things, I'm sure. Well, political redistricting, of course, is the most supremely political act, I guess, of, of any uh, anything, uh, gerrymandering and all of that, uh, uh, not a nerd of and all that. It would just be interesting to see, uh, because Chittenden County, uh, conversely, now is just accelerating even more as being uh, the most populous county in, in the state by... A, I guess a pretty, I, you'd say a pretty shocking margin. I'm just looking for the numbers here. Uh, like 160,000 people live in Chittenden County. Um, and, and continues to grow too, that, that's something. Yeah, uh, so at some point that's gonna get uh, reflected and I think in, in the dis distribution of Senate seats and, and House seats uh, and how they redraw re lines up there. I'm not sure if, uh, you know, there would be much impact down here uh, as to whether or not uh, we might, you know, get reshuffled somehow. But uh, that'll certainly be interesting to follow. The, the whole the whole census uh, data thing is really quite interesting, not just on our state and local level, but also nationally. And there's uh, been a lot of discussion about that uh, over the past week or so since the numbers came out uh, and how that might play out nationally. I, I, I misspoke. I said the House Speaker. I meant the Senate pro tem. <laughs> <laughs> wanted to correct that. And Senator Ballant, yes. Uh, well, all right. Well, I want to thank both of you again uh, very much for making the time for the conversation today. Darren Marcy, editor of the Manchester Journal. Howard Weiss-Tisman, who covers uh, Southern Vermont for Vermont Public Radio. Uh, and thanks to all of you as well for being with us. Hope you've enjoyed our uh, discussion and show. And we'll see you again the next time. And meanwhile, thanks for having us. Have a great day, everybody.